Welcome to our special conversation about the metaverse. We're streaming live on CBS News Boston, Facebook, and YouTube. I'm Paula Eben. There's a serious push for big tech for people to explore this new immersive online universe. And as David Wade shows us, there are also new opportunities to make money there. And the metaverse is the next frontier, just like social networking was when we got started. It is a major shift in the way the tech world wants us to think about the internet, the metaverse. John Radoff is the CEO of the gaming platform company called Beamable and says the movement to a more immersive digital world has been happening for some time. Today we now have a couple of generations of people who have grown up with the internet, with their digital identity being online. Billions of people now, they are starting to find that their digital identity, their expression online, is even more important than their physical identity. Radoff is among those laying the groundwork for the metaverse and says it all begins with video games. Players are going to be creating content. They'll be crafting experiences. They'll be like dungeon masters leading adventures. This is what many of us grew up on. Nintendo games like Super Mario Brothers, beating 8-bit beasts and collecting lots of coins. But now blockchain-based games like Axie Infinity could allow players to get a real payday. It's, it's kind of like Pokemon where you buy a character and then you can make your characters more powerful or you breed characters together and they can earn money by participating in the economy of that game. Or buy land next to Snoop Dogg in the Sandbox game, which looks a lot like the rapper's own home in California. You will be adding art to the game. You'll be a crafter within the game. You'll make worlds, you'll make fashions, and those fashions could be digital assets called NFT or non-fungible tokens. The economy is, is left to the players to trade with each other and retain them if they want or sell them to another player who, who values it more. Radoff says the metaverse will also open up the global economy. It's going to allow a lot of people all over the world to access markets that they don't have access to right now and find new ways to earn money. And he expects most of the metaverse to be decentralized. That means banks are out and financial equality is in. Well, you don't have to be blessed by a gatekeeper anymore. And Radoff wants to clarify a common misconception. He says while a lot of the metaverse will be virtual reality or augmented reality, others will be able to participate on a regular computer or your phone. I'm David Wade, WBZ News. So we are joined now by Metaverse expert and CEO of the gaming creation company Beamable, John Radoff. John, thanks so much for joining us for this discussion this afternoon. Thanks for having me here. That's great. You know, it's so interesting you talk about a lack of gatekeepers because I think we're kind of at the point right now uh, where people can't envision what the metaverse is yet. And by the way, we are looking for questions from our audience. So if you're watching and you're following us on Facebook or streaming on the website or YouTube, we will try to get your questions answered. So please uh, send them in. Um, I think right now, if people put themselves back to the 90s when they were on those first websites just buying things, then... of the lens of culture and society first and then the technology second. So I, I actually go way back to like Dungeons and Dragons before it ever existed as a, as a game you could play online was this game of shared imagination and storytelling and creativity mm. and it was all real time. So I think if you start there, those properties that I just described, that's what the metaverse really is. It's us being in a place together in real time where we can be creative and and participate with each other. All the technology is then aiding us in our ability to dematerialize that, digitize it, 
cross time and space mm-hmm. so that we can do all this from our homes. But it all comes down to creativity and shared space. Right. So I guess you could say for um, a movie analogy, most people think of Ready Player One or The Matrix, right, where it's an immersive experience within a community. You could even say Peloton <laughs> is sort of an early version of this, right, where people are in an exercise community. They're with people all around the world. Uh, they're not physically together, but there is an entire culture and community around it. Yeah, 100%. Peloton is what is one example that I've written about on my blog, mm-hmm. for example, particularly when you're in there in real time with other people. But geez, I hope that it's never the matrix where we're just batteries for computers. And, <laughs> and I think Ready Player One is, in many ways, it shows the, the applications, but it's the opposite of what the metaverse really should be because there, that's like this example where one company owns everything, right? They have this thing called the Oasis and everyone gets to basically rent space there. Right. The metaverse is really the next generation of the internet in that it's decentralized. Everybody gets to participate. Just like you can launch a website, you'll be able to launch a world or an experience yeah. within the metaverse. I do think it was very interesting though, in January, we saw that massive deal where Microsoft spent north of $70 billion to buy Activision. <laughs> the video gaming company clearly seeing that video gaming is the way for them into the metaverse, right? So Microsoft and other companies, Disney Plus, they talk about all kinds of uh, different retailers are going to start to see this as a way to make money. But what you're saying is to decentralize the metaverse, people will be able to not have to Um, be involved in the creation of a corporation, but will be able to create metaverse experiences of their own design. That's the way it should be. And, but we have to build all of that. So right now, if you want to build these things, it's either very technically complex, right? Like Activision, the company that was bought by Microsoft in that huge deal, actually the largest deal in technology history. Um, They actually spoke about one of the reasons why they merged with Microsoft is because it was getting so hard for even them to hire expertise and things like cloud-based technology and artificial intelligence and what they call live operations. Mm. So that had been a, a real impediment to them. So if it's hard for them, it's hard for a lot of people. So there have been these other companies that have come along, like I think Roblox is a really great example where they've made it a little bit easier to make that content, but it's still, you know, it's still a certain amount of coding. It's, you're still limited in what you can create, but that's the opportunity that that's kind of what I'm doing with my own company is Mm -hmm. providing more of that infrastructure that you need to allow everybody to be creative and build things that they're actually going to own themselves. Well, this is what's interesting is that, as you say, no, no uh, reason to reinvent the Xbox, right? So, so Microsoft clearly sees the way to populate their version of the metaverse will be through the, the, the gamers. And one event that is beginning to happen inside some of those video games, inside Fortnite or inside some other games like Halo, will that be that young people are attending concerts, right? They'll play, hmm. pay for a pop star to give a 10 minute performance and you can only see it if you're in there, if you're in the game, right? Very good observation. I mean, in general, it's game technology and game systems and game designs that are enabling the entire metaverse. So I think that's a lot of why Microsoft bought Activision. That's why they bought Minecraft, for example, in the past, because they see that coming where Mm. game tech is going to enable it. But then what you're observing here with these music concerts that are happening online is now that we've got these immersive spaces inspired by games, that you'll be able to have what I think of as like game adjacent applications. They're going to be more social. They're not, you're not going to go into it necessarily for a game, but the game technology is going to shape the experience around it. So yeah, Fortnite, Roblox, Decentraland, these are all these immersive 3D spaces where there have been these enormous concerts that have taken place, which I think is really interesting because mm. the concert experience, of course, you have to travel to it. There's limited seats and I don't think we're talking about completely taking away the idea that people are still going to want to go and 
be there with people in a concert, but to be able to bring millions upon millions more people into that experience within virtual space, it does open up a new kind of experience where you'll be able to hang out with your friends and experience something that's real time with lots and lots of people participating in it, in it with, at a much greater level of abundance than what you could do in physical space. Right. And so, of course, inevitably, talking about any community or culture where people are going to gather, uh, like they do with Peloton or in these virtual worlds, advertising will follow, right? They're going to try and sell us stuff. How do you envision that happening? Inevitable is a word I've learned to avoid <laughs> <laughs> with respect to the technology yeah. industry. I, I find that things are very evitable and, and have to be built by companies that, that want to do things. You know, no doubt there's going to be advertising in aspects of the metaverse, just as there is in all other aspects of the internet, or for that matter, in our lives as we drive by billboards or, or read magazines. So there's going to be certain kinds of games, experiences, applications that will use advertising as, as their business model mm -hmm. and would otherwise not exist without them. But I think what's interesting about Metaverse is that it does open up a lot of other business models as well. So advertising is one, but this thing that's emerged within games over the last you know, 10 plus years has been what they call free to play economies where you download the game for free. And then when you want to, you'll buy characters or power-ups or content within that game. That's just another business model. And then as mm -hmm. we go into the metaverse, it may take that to the next level where there will be open economies around that as well, where certain games will have the opportunity for people to add stuff to it. This is, you kind of see a little bit of this now in Minecraft, in Roblox, mm -hmm. in, in game environments and platforms like that, where there's this blending of the distinction between who's a player, who's a creator, who's a storyteller, mm -hmm. and opening up more participation in that. And then ultimately, when it's decentralized, you'll be able to to truly own these experiences on your own. Interesting. So how do you define this as sort of Web 3.0? And what will that mean for our connection to the metaverse? Yeah, so let's define Web 3, I guess. Web 3 is the idea that you can have a digital wallet that contains cryptocurrencies and digital assets, which you know, NFTs and whatnot, mm -hmm. where you can then use those currencies and assets in applications that are web-based and the applications are decentralized. They're not run or, you know, limited by any particular central authority or central company that decides what gets to be on there or not. It's just more of a relationship between you and your digital wallet and those applications. And that's really what Web3 is. And it, and it has sort of a wide range of applications from financial applications, what they call decentralized finance, where you can do things, for example, like loan money to another person and be able to have it operated by smart contracts instead of having, for example, a bank or a lending authority that decides and administers all that. But then it applies to games as well. But to be clear, like Web3 is going to open up a lot of these economies for a certain class of games. Some people kind of think of Web3 and Metaverse as the same thing. Like it goes back to these definitions that exist. There's the, there's the meta Facebook version. There's the blockchain version of this where it's all Web3. There's my version, which is more about digital identity and creativity and real-time space. I think that all of these things are going to exist simultaneously web3 is going to is going to apply to a certain class of applications potentially the largest class of applications but there's also going to be lots of things in the metaverse that are built like traditional games like theme parks that you visit where it has nothing to do with cryptocurrency there's going to be immersive real time experiences and concerts and mm -hmm fitness applications like Peloton and all that stuff is also going to exist there. So sometimes a crypto economy makes a lot of sense for a certain game application or experience. Sometimes it won't. We'll, we'll see all of the above happen in the metaverse. Right. They talk about you'll be able someday to go into a metaverse experience where you meet a friend in Rome. 
at a cafe for a drink, right? Will you feel as though you're really there? Do you think that the metaverse will replace for some people some real life interactions? Well, I think that it already does mm -hmm. do that in, in many respects for certain things. Are we going to be at a place where I can taste the coffee right. on remote? We'll need brain computer interface for that. That's, that's a long way off, but just in the near term, I, I can tell you from my own experiences um, that when you enter an embodied experience where you're in a space together with people, it does feel different than say, all of the video teleconferencing that all of us have gotten so used to over the last couple of years through Zoom. Zoom is very helpful, but it's still, a, there's still limited bandwidth mm. to that communication by which I mean, when you're in a physical space with someone, not only is your body language relevant, even how you orient yourself to someone in a room towards another person is an important part of how you communicate. So being able to bring more of that to the experience is some of the stuff that I think we'll start to see both in VR, virtual reality and AR, augmented reality over, over the coming years as that stuff gets more accessible to right. worldwide market of consumers. And I think the way most people visualize that right now was through that Mark Zuckerberg video that went viral of his avatar in the metaverse, picking out an outfit, meeting with people, and clearly all of that technology will grow more sophisticated. I'm sure it will look as though you are actually there, but that also brings up if you're picking out your clothes and your environment in a metaverse meeting location with other people. I mean, what is the potential for the economy of the metaverse? The future that I'm looking forward to is not one in which you're simply choosing things off of like a rack of virtual clothes or building things from a selection of things that are presented in front of you so that you can just customize like your homeroom. That's part of it. I'm much more interested in getting to the point of like a, a direct from imagination experience where you can sculpt an experience. You really can create that world yourself, define the rules that govern it, create the game systems if it's a game, create the other systems if it's not a game, if it's around music or fitness or whatever, as we've talked about. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to require a lot of easier to use tools, no code and low code things. So you don't necessarily have to be a programmer, lots of cloud-based technology that just makes that stuff immediately available to people across the world in real time. And also the participation of things like artificial intelligence, where the AI becomes like a creative partner with you so that when you have the idea, the AI works with you to populate a world that you then modify and sculpt and edit around. Mm -hmm. So. That is what I'm really interested in. I, I think creativity is so fundamentally human that the ability for people to be creative in this space, which has now become really the media category of our time, whether we're talking about games or as it grows into metaverse, I want everybody to be able to experience that creative spark in the metaverse and, and own a part of it, make stuff share it with their friends, whether it's just for their small group of friends that they're meeting with online or building big, huge experiences for mass markets. Right. You talked a little bit about how cryptocurrency will influence these experiences where people will actually trade and, and use it in exchange for, for various items. Let's talk about blockchain. I think this is part of the whole cryptocurrency conversation that, for, for me anyway, I've had so many people explain it to me in depth, <laughs> but blockchain uh, will have a huge impact on the way the metaverse evolves. And do you worry that the amount of computer power uh, that it takes to mine and to create blockchains. There's been a lot of criticism that it's bad for the environment. Um, do you think that that is going to have an adverse effect on the development or is this just another unstoppable aspect of growing the metaverse? Well, nothing is unstoppable and lots of things still need to be improved. And one of those is making the systems for exchanging cryptocurrency more energy efficient and environmentally friendly. So when people 
think about what you just described. They're usually what they usually have in mind is Bitcoin, for example. So Bitcoin requires a tremendous amount of energy to conduct and validate transactions on the network. And it was intentional by design. The thinking was that it would be very, very secure if done that way. Mm -hmm. And I don't think Bitcoin is going to depart from that. There's been other cryptocurrencies that have been created. When we talk about metaverse, though, we are going to need transactions to happen very, very fast. And there's going to be a lot more of them, right? So you're talking, if you look at games, for example, games have millions of transactions that happen continuously. So you have to be able to do that super energy efficient. So there's been a new um, set of technologies for validating the transactions of cryptocurrencies, something they call proof of stake, which is just a new technology, which means you're not doing that heavy proof of work, the cryptographically intensive computation that's in involved in things like coin. Mm -hmm. And these technologies, by the way, they're already available. And we're not talking about like future roadmap. There's already these blockchains like Polygon and Solana and Avalanche are just examples of, of names of some of these newer technologies that can be fast and very energy efficient. Really, when we think about the metaverse, it, it, most of the energy will be consumed by the, the GPUs, the graphics cards in your computer on the front end and the cloud-based components, the stuff happening on the internet will really be very, very small for that. But that's because a lot of these applications are gonna require digital assets that mm. people can trade through markets and you have to be able to check whether someone really owns a particular thing and people have to be able to trade them with each other. And that stuff cannot be done the same way that either Bitcoin or Ethereum have historically been done, which is these super computationally heavy cryptographic um, solution solving systems. So, so the blockchain is the answer for that. Just to explain for those of us who are you know, not, not as uh, familiar with the depth of this as you are, what blockchain means? So blockchain is really just the idea of having a distributed ledger of transactions. So imagine that you have an accounting book recording all of the transactions, except now instead of one person having the accounting book on their computer that they then allow access to, mm -hmm. we copy the, the list of transactions across a lot of other computers where it's replicated. And then there's a process by which transactions can be added and distributed across all of those copies of that ledger. That's what that's all that blockchain right. is fundamentally. And the first way that was invented to solve this problem and do it in a secure way required this Bitcoin proof of work, mm. which is, you know, requires very, very heavy computing power to do. But now there are, there are these other applications that do it, but they're all blockchain in one way or another. Right. So blockchain means that there would be transparency in all of the transactions that happen. Here's something that I think people worry about as you talk about people getting creative and uh, really creating the architecture of these environments where people will go and hang out for a while, hang out with each other, their friends, their family. Do you envision people spending hours of their day in the metaverse? Probably in the same way that they that I think people spend hours of their day Scrolling. watching television, watching Netflix, looking at Facebook, playing an online game. Yeah. But it, it's interesting, though, because I, I kind of look back to the past, like, what if books as a technology hadn't existed so far and suddenly we introduced it to people and suddenly we had all these people going off and reading a book all by themselves and they were spending hours and hours mm -hmm. of a day reading a book, maybe people would be up in arms about that. And the interesting thing about this stuff that we're talking about is it's social. So you're interacting with other people and it's not a replacement for meeting people in quote unquote real life and, right. and having that physical interaction. I personally think that continues to be very, very important to us as a human species. But what it does allow you to do is enter into a space and have interactions with other people who maybe you wouldn't have met, wouldn't have been able to met, and even be able to take on roles that you wouldn't have been able to have before. So it's, I think it's 
can be creative, it can be emancipatory for people, and it can be very social. Do you think everyone will be able to access the metaverse eventually? That it will be for everyone? I would hope so. I mean, if we look at the worldwide market for computer games as just one predictor of this, there's about 3 billion people in the world that play computer games on, on some regular basis. So that's an awfully large percentage of the world. Now, clearly it isn't all of the world or most of the world. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that the technology isn't available to everyone. So this requires very high speed networks, telecommunications, access to devices. And over the last couple of decades, a lot of this stuff has become far more accessible to people, but it isn't available to everyone yet. So over time, hopefully it will become available to even more people. I'm, I don't think I'm quite enough of a utopianist to think that it can be available to everybody. But as battery life gets longer, as manufacturing processes for these semiconductors gets cheaper, as it continues to scale out, as the material science behind these things gets more and more refined and developed, I think that we'll be able to bring very advanced virtual reality augmented reality. And also, by the way, you don't have to be in VR, AR, it could be on your computer screen, it could right. even be on your phone. So we'll make this accessible through different kinds of technologies that are appropriate for different kinds of experiences and open it up so that anybody can participate with the level of technology that they have. Right. I look back and I picture those first big, huge car phones with the antennas that were coming out of the roof of the car, and now GPS and self-parking automobiles. No one could have possibly imagined it. So, John Radoff, thank you so much for explaining some of this for us. It was fascinating, and I think it's uh, been able to uh, allow us to kind of envision what the metaverse will mean. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. We'll take a break. And thanks for joining us for this discussion on the metaverse. Winter at WBZ, it's 